let me welcome you to the public consultation on the Jury Act. By way of formality, my name is David Archer Jr. I am the Deputy Governor of the Virgin Islands. This evening, we are pleased to be joined by the Honorable Premier, the Honorable Natalia Wheatley. Just for formality, he will be on rather shortly as he concludes another meeting. Additionally, this evening we have with us, we have the Deputy Secretary in the Deputy Governor's Office, Ms. Aisha Hill. We have the Registrar of the High Court, Mrs. Vantipool Nibs, Mrs. Vereen Vantipool Nibs. We also have the Court Manager for the Magistrate's Court, Mrs. Annette William Sylvester. In addition, we have the Security and Justice Advisor in the Deputy Governor's Office, Mrs. Olva McKenzie Agard. And Mrs. Agard will be taking us through the presentation. I want to thank you very much for being here, for taking your time out this evening, and to discuss a very critical legislation within the territory. From its original date in 19. 14 to an amendment, its first amendment in 1995 to its second amendment in 2005. We're now 2022 having a discussion about how we improve this piece of legislation. Naturally, it impacts persons within the territory. It is the bedrock and the foundation of our legal system and ensuring that there is justice and fairness through persons who will serve as jurors. Again, with your permission, as the Premier comes online, I would like to pause and allow him to greet us formally. But in the meantime, I will ask Mrs. Agard to begin with the presentation. As she prepares, just to let you know, we will take questions that will be entered through Facebook or any other medium. We'll have someone who will moderate that section and we will answer any questions as they come in. We are happy that you're online and ask you please to share the link as we speak about the jury bill 2022, its amendments, its changes, and how it impacts you within the territory. Thank you very much. And I will just ask as you present also to please share your video. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Deputy Governor. Um, could someone indicate to me whether or not you're seeing my screen, please? I saw it previously. I no longer see it. So maybe you can try one more time. OK, I'm seeing it now. I'm seeing it now. OK, thank you. So as the Deputy Governor said, I'll be taking you through a short overview of the Jury Bill of 2022. The new Jury Bill is pertinent for a number of reasons. These include the fact that the current legislation has been in place for over a cent century having been enacted in 1914, as mentioned by the Deputy Governor. Additionally, over the years, there has been a number of challenges to the Act, with a ruling of unconstitutionality in at least one instance. Now, who can serve as a juror under the new bill? Under the new bill, the list of persons who can serve as a juror has expanded. In order to qualify as a juror, a person must be at least 18 years of age, but not more than 70 years old. And that person must either be a belonger, be a person to whom a certificate of residence was granted under the Immigration Act, a person who is on the register of voters, or a person who has been resident in the Virgin Islands for at least 10 years. Alternatively, there are a number of persons who are ineligible to serve as jurors. 
These are those persons who are unable to speak, read, or write English, those persons who have a physical or mental condition that will impair his or her capacity to fully discharge the functions of a juror, a person convicted of an offense and sentenced to at least 12 months in prison, a person of bad character, a person who is before the court with respect to criminal proceedings, a person who is declared bankrupt, and of course, a person who is under 18, year, 18 years of age or over 70 years. Such persons cannot serve as a juror. Now, there are a number of persons who are exempted from jury service. These include the governor and his spouse, members of cabinet and their spouses, the cabinet secretary, members of the House of Assembly and their spouses, the clerk of the House of Assembly, the director of public prosecutions and councils of the DPP office, in, as well as their parents and siblings, the attorneys in government or private practice, the auditor general, the accountant general, police officers and prison officers, along with their spouses, medical practitioners in active practice working for the government, essential staff and ministers of religion, among others. All of these persons are exempted from jury service. We now turn to the jurors list, the preparation and publication of that list. The jurors list is required to be compiled in October of every year. The list is required to be published in the Gazette and at least one newspaper of general circulation. Additionally, copies of the list are required to be posted at the magistrate's court, the post offices, churches, police stations, community centers, the government administration buildings, and such other places as directed by the registrar. Objections. Persons can make objections and the registrar is required to receive and hear any objections. If a person is dissatisfied with the decision of the registrar after having raised an objection, that person may appeal to a judge in chambers. Where any alterations or corrections were made to the jurors list, these are required to be published by the registrar in a similar manner as the jurors list is required to be published. Summoning of a juror. The process of commencing service as a juror is by way of summons signed by the registrar. This service is to be done at least eight days before the date of the respective sitting of the court. Now service of the summons can be done in several ways, either by delivering it directly to the person in cases where the person refuses to accept it by leaving the summons at the feet of that person, by leaving the summons at the person's last or most usual place of abode or business, and by sending that summons either via ordinary mail or by electronic mail. Noteworthy, however, there are some instances where some persons will not be summoned. For example, if a person is temporarily absent from the territory and not likely to return in time for the court sitting. 
or if a person has, within the last two years, been selected to serve as a juror. Also, if a person is currently employed at the same place as a person who has already been summoned to serve as a juror, or if a person is the spouse of a juror who has already been summoned, those persons will not be summoned to serve as a juror. Challenges. Each party is entitled to a number of challenges, both peremptory challenges and challenges for cause. In the case of peremptory challenges, either party is entitled to no more than three. In cases where two or more persons are arraigned, each such person has three peremptory challenges and the Crown has three for each such person arraigned. In cases where alternate jurors have been selected, in addition to the peremptory challenges mentioned above, where one person is arraigned, each arraigned party is entitled to one peremptory challenge. Where two or more persons are arraigned, each arraigned person is entitled to one peremptory challenge and the Crown is entitled to one for each person so arraigned. In cases of challenge for a cause, each party can challenge for a cause without restriction. Offenses. In instances, where a person summoned does not attend or does not answer to a call after having been called three times or the person is present but does not appear after being called or the person withdraws from the court without the leave of the judge or without reasonable cause such a person can be fined up to $2,000. Additionally, a person summoned who refuses to serve or leaves the court before a verdict is given can face a fine of up to $3,000. A person who makes an entry in the jury database, knowing it to be false, or causes or permits any false representation, or makes or causes to be made on behalf of another person any such false representation, or knowing he or she is not qualified to serve as a juror, and so serves, also commits an offense. A person who corruptly influences or attempts to influence a juror in the performance of that juror's function also commits an offense. Lastly, some pertinent information. A jury and panel shall consist of nine persons. A court may direct that no more than six alternate jurors be selected. If during a trial, one of the jurors serving is absent or dies or is incapable of serving, the juror will be replaced by an alternate juror. The judge may allow the jury and panel to reasonable refreshments at the expense of the Crown. And lastly,
in a very concise way, but highlight in very critical po points. Obviously, something which is new, the, the age range from 18 to 70. Um, you've gone through also the penalties associated with not showing up or even persons not complying to the summons. Uh, very serious job to ensure law and order within the territory. Thank you very much for that. At this time, if we have questions online, I will just ask you to hold those questions, please, and allow me to welcome Dr. the Honorable Natalia Weekly, the Premier of the Virgin Islands and our Minister of Finance. Premier. Uh, thank you. Thank you, um, esteemed Deputy Governor. And I greet all other persons on the call and, of course, um, the viewing public. Um, I want to thank um, the Deputy Governor's um, office um, for convening this meeting. Of, of course, we know that the administration of the courts is one of the governor's special responsibilities, uh, which he delegates to the deputy governor. And I also want to show appreciation um, to members of the court system here, as well as Mrs. Kenzie Agard uh, for giving her presentation. I certainly apologize uh, for being tardy as I was um, closing off another meeting. And um, please forgive me for not having my jacket on because, of course, in coming to my office, um, it's, it's raining quite heavily and I, and I got wet. Uh, but I'm happy to be here at this meeting and, and really just to, to be a part of it because, of course, it's my responsibility to bring uh, this jury act to the House of Assembly. Uh, it's been given its first reading already, and uh, we wanted to have a dialogue with the public before it's given its second and third reading, which could come as early as, as tomorrow, and to make sure that if, if persons had any um, queries, if they had any questions, uh, we had the requisite persons in their fields, in their areas of expertise, who would be able to, to answer the questions. My reading of the bill, of course, is that it's uh, seeking to solve some challenges that we've had uh, within our jury pool, um, given the narrowness of our jury pool uh, before. And certainly the persons who participate in the process will be able to speak about some of the challenges that existed due to the restrictiveness of the pool uh, before. And we're hopeful that this will help to solve some of those challenges. So DG, I will stop there. Uh, my role is simply to, to listen, uh, to be able to make notes, and uh, so that I can be well informed uh, when we debate the bill and when we go into committee stage and potentially make amendments. Uh, this is the legislative process, and we want to make sure that we respect the legislative process, notwithstanding, of course, that we have committed ourselves to implementing recommendations uh, of the Commission of Inquiry. But we certainly are taking ownership of the whole concept of reform, and let's take this opportunity to look at all areas of our governance, all institutions within these Virgin Islands that we believe need reform, that we believe need to function better. Um, let's um, take a look at those areas um, where we have weaknesses. Let's fix those weaknesses. Let's do that through consultation with various stakeholders, uh, those persons who uh, have expertise in a particular area, experience in a particular area. Uh, let's have consultation with the public um, who um, require public services uh, from our various departments and ministries. And, and let's come up with something that works for everyone. 
So DJ, I'm glad um, to be a part of this meeting. Um, thank you for uh, hosting this meeting and I'm looking forward to um, a robust round of questions, comments and suggestions. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Premier, and for being with us naturally when you called and expressed to me the importance of the dialogue with the public. I was eager to facilitate your presence, but also as you demonstrate the importance of consultation before legislations are advanced through the House of Assembly. I know we have a few questions online, but I would like to invite the Registrar of the High Court, Mrs. Ventable Nibs, to give some remarks. It could be along the lines of why is the change is important to you or how would you see this making the process easier with jury. No format, but I'd like you please to address us. Thank you very much, Mrs. Ventable Nibs. Thank you, Deputy Governor. Good evening, everyone. Um, on panel and the wider listening public. Um, to jump right in, um, I adopt the protocol already established, and also I certainly am happy for Ms. Mackenzie Agad's presentation on the overall layout of the new jury bill. Um, very similar to the old bill in structure, but there are obviously some very key differences in this new bill, which um, has been said already. Um, some changes have been long overdue. Um, one of the great concerns that has been coming up time and time again is that perhaps there had come a time in um, where we are in the territory to have a more diverse jury pool and not one um, simply seemingly confined to just coming from the voters list. So this bill in particular focuses on creating a wider diverse pool. Um, Mrs. Agad has already identified that one very important difference is that you now have persons aged from 18 to Sorry about that. Um, 8 to 20, 18 to 70 years of age um, as now qualifying to be on the jury pool. Um, persons also who are resident in the territory for about 10 years. And there are others, as uh, Mrs. Agar listed, I won't repeat those, but the point of that really is the aim was to achieve um, having a more diverse jury pool. That has been important because there have been a couple of cases where um, a number of the jurors selected had to be uh, stood aside given their close connection to um, persons in the trial itself. So by enabling a more diverse panel, the hope is that in any term, you'd be able to get through um, successfully your criminal trials um, with the selected jurors, and in fact, um, persons will feel that justice would be served in that the selection of persons on the jury pool would be fair, objective, um, and so forth. The other big change in the new jury bill, would um, persons would notice that um, a lot of the selection and final confirmation of the jurors register the jury register has been shifted to the registrar and not the magistrate as the old bill um, was structured. So the registrar um, now has a lot more responsibility under this particular um, legislation. Um, it is guessed that one reason for that is to save quality judicial time of the magistrate perhaps. Um, and not have the magistrate bogged down with um, going through the rudiments of putting together this uh, jury list. But 
notwithstanding the magistrate's court, the magistrate is still very much involved with um, the entire process of finalizing the annual uh, jurors register. Um, the other point I want to make real quick is to say that um, coming at this point, this new bill also consolidates some of the more recent amendments we've had to the jury bill. Um, one recent amendment concerned fees paid to jurors who are serving, and another very important amendment um, that was just a couple of years ago relates to offenses, particularly uh, employers of relative to employers of jurors. There had been a number of cases where jurors would complain that, that employers would try to penalize them in some way um, for their time of service. And uh, they, an amendment was done concerning that. And that also falls within this new bill because it's certainly very important to be very clear that jury service is an important civic duty and uh, whoever serves ought not to be penalized uh, disadvantaged in any way. So um, it's an important bill. Um, as I mentioned, it, it took a little while to get to this point. It, in my view, covers a number of the issues that um, crept up over the recent years. So it's, it's composite and complete in that regard. And uh, we're hopeful that once it's, it's, it passes, um, it can be tested fully and uh, it will be considered to be a proper bill reflecting uh, where we are and it functions well. So those are my expectations and um, I look forward to its passage. Thank you. Deputy Governor. Thank you very much. You were, you were kind and polite in noting the responsibility that rests with your shoulders. So thank you for that. <laughs> I, I will now ask Deputy Secretary Aisha Hill if we have questions online, if we can take at least two questions, and we'll also hear from the court manager as we transition from the questions. Ms. Hill? We have questions online, we can take at least two questions, and we'll also hear from Good evening, everyone. Thank you, sir. The first question is, why is there an age limit of 70 years? Good evening, everyone. Thank you, sir. I'll repeat that. Why is there an age limit of 70 years? Should I jump in and answer that one? Go right ahead, please. Thank you. Um, the adjustment was actually made uh, from age 60 to 70. Um, it being well argued that um, persons beyond the age of 60 years, as the existing legislation uh, has it, can still make a meaningful contribution and actively participate on a jury panel. So 70 was considered the upper end of it. Um, and I think it's fair to say that the persons who discussed this at length thought that 70 years um, would be a fair cutoff point, um, five years beyond or what we call a statutory um, age of retirement. And um, persons at the age of 70 could be considered, you know, for suitable for the jury pool, but we wouldn't go beyond that. Thank you very much, Ms. Hill. A follow-up follow question, Madam Registrar. Um, someone said that you need to be in sound health to be a juror. People over 70 tend to have hearing loss and additional challenges that will hinder them from hearing the case, resulting in mischild or hung jury. Do you have any comments on that? 
very long. Just to say that um, persons who would be selected would not only be selected because of age, but also considering their present state. So if a person is known to be having health challenges or they themselves raise or indicate that they have health challenges, including those mentioned, then uh, obviously they won't be deemed suitable to sit on a jury panel for those reasons, not merely because they're uh, 70. So it really is the, the total picture of the person, age plus their ability, competence, um, overall suitability to serve on our jury panel. Thank you for that. And on the lighter note, these are persons at age 70 who have given tremendously to their community. And when you're, when you're asked to be a juror, you're not wave, waving your hand and say, sure, I would like to or would not like to, or maybe Tuesday and not Thursday. This is something that you must comply with, except you have reasons for not complying. So the discussion was felt that age 70 persons are still bright, still able to contribute. However, to make the demand on persons who have served and made those contributions, we felt age 70 was a good period to, to have a cutoff. Ms. Hill, other questions? Yes, sir. When speaking about the disqualification of jurors, reference was made to persons of bad character who may be subject to disqualification. Section 6, subsection 2 of the bill vaguely explains the term pointing to the act of misconduct, but there may be a need for more clarity as to what exactly deems someone of bad character or of misconduct. So the person is basically asking for clarification on what is meant by bad character. Mrs. Zagard, do you want to please respond? And then we'll hear from also the registrar. Yes, sorry, DG. Um, so the, the jury bill defines bad character. Um, to mean a person who has evidence of misconduct or a person who has a disposition towards misconduct. Thank you very much. Madam Registrar, do you want to, to add to the discussion since you will be key in assessing such qualities? Uh, thank you, uh, DG. I consider the definition to be very helpful, actually. Um, and I don't think I'm able to add to that um, in any material way at this point. There has been um, certain judicial decisions on, on the term bad character. I suppose a more academic discussion could go in those directions, but for the purposes of this legislation, I consider that definition to be workable and understandable. Okay, thank you, Madam Registrar. I have another question. What sort of fees are jurors entitled to? Okay, thank you, Madam Registrar. Okay. 
Is the question asking me the specific amounts, which I don't have in front of me, or just generally uh, when you'd likely um, be paid? I see, I Ms. The question Ms. asking me the specific amounts, which I, I don't have in front of me, or just generally uh, when you'd likely um, be paid? I think just I general. Specific amounts, I don't have in front of me. Right. Okay. So, um, Mrs. Agad, I see her hand raised, but what I would like to say on that is once you're serving on a jury pool in that you've been actually um, chosen to sit on a matter for the period of time that you're sitting on that matter, you will, um, in fact, be compensated. If you're traveling in from a sister island, um, we're responsible for your travel on the days related to trial for getting you to court and back. Uh, we're responsible for obviously provisioning for your refreshments during the day period. And for the period that you're serving um, on a trial, you will in fact be compensated. In some cases, I might add it would perhaps not compare to uh, the full salary that you may uh, be getting, but it is in recognition that um, you are you be are using your time and you are giving service and it is the state's way of saying uh, thank you and some compensation is actually um, paid. Thank you. Maybe this is also a good transitional period, Mrs. Agar, to speak about what happened happens if an employer, for example, refuses to compensate you or pay you for, for not being present because you have to serve as a juror. Are you able to give some thoughts to that as Ms. Hill gets other questions, please? Yes, DG. Can I also add to what Roger Strauss said in relation to the fees? Um, so the specific amount for the fees that's outlined in the rules, the rules to the act. So a juror is entitled to an allowance of $20 a day or for part of the day for each day he or she attends court. In addition to that, the juror is entitled to allowance, subsistence allowance of $10 a day or part of the day, and also traveling allowance for every mile he or she travels to get to court. Um, bearing in mind that these rules are old as well, and at some point, I'm sure they will be updated. With respect to employer, there are a number of prohibitions um, on employer. So an employer is not required um, to is not required to the fee, it's not an employer is not to require the person to whom fees are paid. So the juror to pay any to him or her. The employer is not entitled to the fees of the juror. The employer cannot deduct any monies from the juror's salary, the juror's allowances or gratuity because that person has served as a juror, nor can an employer penalize any person on account of the fact that he or she has served as a juror. The employer must allow the, the juror time to attend all um, sittings as required. Thank you very much. Ms. Hill, please continue with questions. Thank you very much. Ms. Hill, please continue with questions. The next question, DG, how do you prove whether someone has been in the Virgin Islands for 10 or more years? How will the registrar know whether someone is in the territory? Can I answer that? Yes, as you, as you answer, please identify yourself. Thank you very much. Is this Ms. This is William Sylvester? Yes, good evening, everyone, yes. Go right ahead, please. Bas basically, what would have to be done is that you would have to get proof of that person's immigration status. 
in order for you to know exactly the amount of years they have been living in the BVI. Thank you, DJ. And just to add on to that, if I may, uh, DG, uh, just to indicate as well that the, the new bill um, lays out very clearly that the registrar can now obtain information, um, again, relative to this very question of ascertaining um, how long a person may have been in the territory. Um, the registrar would now have the power to directly engage the chief immigration officer on such questions. So greater assistance is spelled out in the, the new jury bill so that the work could be uh, expedited. Thank you. And if you're following, that will be part four and section nine. And I think that's a good, but a very good addition to the legislation in terms of ensuring we have persons true information in terms of their years of service within the territory. Ms. Hill, please proceed. Thank you. Yes, so um, the other question is, why should employers who pay more tax and social security and national health insurance than employees have to then subsidize, subsidize the government by paying employees for the time on a jury? That seems fundamentally wrong. Should I repeat that? There's no need to. I was hoping someone was going to jump on, but it's. I think it's a question everyone has asked. Obviously, the whole idea of subsidizing government is a question as to whether or not employees should be paid if they're serving as jurors. It is something which is not just within the territory, but part of a global standard that person should not be penalized for having the ability to serve and to perform a civic duty. So it comes under the umbrella of being a civic duty and that they should not be penalized because it's not a fault of their own that they will not be able to be on the job at the time and they should not negatively be impacted in that regard. It has always been a question of concern. However, because it's overall civil duty for persons to serve, employees should also comply accordingly. As we transition to other questions, the court manager of the Magistrate's Court, Mrs. Annette Williams-Sylvester, allow you to give a few input into where we are right now and any, anything else you'd like to add to the conversation. Thank you. Good evening again, everyone. I too would like to, you know, um, say that the jury act has been long outdated and it does need amendments to it i think um for example the discussion with pad for with the preparation of the list that um played a role where we only looked at the area where the names would come from the the supervisor of elections the voters list but with this new legislation now put in place, we have a variety of establishment that can assist with compiling the voters list. And as we see here, we have the um, chief immigration officer, which where we indicated that you can get proof of someone's status. We have the registrar general, we have Labor Commissioner and the Director of Social Security. And I think that this is important on a, a level playing field in, in selecting 
the jurors to do the civic duty of administering justice in our jurisdiction. Thank you, DG. Thank you very much, Mrs. williams Vector. Ms. Hill, do you have a final question before I wrap things up? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mrs. williams Vector. Ms. Hill, do you have a final question before I wrap things up? Thank you very much. Yes, DG, I have one more question and one comment. The bill states that if a person fails to provide information, they can be subject to a fine of $3,000 or up to two years imprisonment. Can we have clarity of the type of information this relates to, as the bill gives the power to have direct contact to labor, immigration, and police? Uh, thank you. Um, Ms. Hill. One example that comes to mind is if a person, when asked certain questions um, relative to the possible connectivity to a matter, they withhold uh, some information that could later jeopardize the, the case. Um, so, Yes, well, um, there would be some measure of due diligence before a person is even put on a juror's register. When a juror is being considered for an actual um, jury panel and specific matter, there is still some further probing that needs to go on to assess their suitability to actually serve on a particular jury. So therein, if there is deliberate withholding of information that could later harm the case, then there's a possibility that such person could be uh, fined for that withholding of critical information. Should I say more? Just ask you to expound, let's say for example, why is, it ra why is it rather critical for persons simply not to lie about, let's say, their association with someone who might be on trial? So to, to be technical about it, um, what could well happen is you end up having what could be called a hung jury um, and mistrial, because depending on what may be later discovered, that the juror may have withheld, um, it could well be argued that the furtherance of the matter could be prejudicial in some way. And if that is the situation, a mistrial could be um, declared. And that causes great expense um, to all involved, uh, including the Crown and the parties themselves. So it is very expensive to, uh, it could be very expensive to withhold information that could get you going in the, up to the middle of a case and then have to restart that entire case all over again. Um, not a very good position to be in, but uh, that's one very apt example of not being forthcoming at the right time, um, putting the entire case at risk and being perhaps vulnerable to be fined as a result. Thank you very much. Honorable Premier, is there a point that you would like to raise or another final comment or a final comment before we conclude? I think we've reached the end of the, the questions. Uh, DG, I just think it has been a very good exchange. Of course, it's, it's a bill that's not that long. It deals specifically with all aspects of, of jury. And I believe that Mrs. Mackenzie Agad, as well as our registrar, Mrs. Vereen Vanderpool Nibs, um, were able to elucidate uh, quite a number of areas that would be of benefit to persons viewing this, this production. And I think would be helpful 
as we go ahead and debate this bill uh, potentially as early as, as tomorrow. So I just want to express my appreciation to Mrs. Mackenzie Agard, um, to Mrs. Vereen Vanterpool Nibs, um, to the public who were able to ask those very good questions that got my mind going, got my mind, um, you know, active and engaged um, as we consider the bill tomorrow. Um, and um, thank you, um, DG, um, for facilitating the session. I think it was helpful, it was useful, um, and I know persons in the public would appreciate it. I appreciate it, certainly, as, um, as, um, as the one who has to bring the bill. Um, it's helpful to me to see some of the questions that the public, public um, possibly may have. And I find that useful. So thank you so much. And um, I, I, I'm pretty sure we'll, we'll have some further sessions similar to this, as of course we have a very ambitious legislative agenda. Um, we have uh, more legislation um, that I will bring forward on behalf of um, the governor via the deputy governor. And um, I'm happy for the, the good working relationship uh, that we've developed thus far. So thank you so much, DG. And um, to the listening public, I, I, I say a pleasant good evening to you. And I look forward uh, to you tuning in uh, to the House of Assembly tomorrow, if indeed we do get to the bill tomorrow. Thank you very much, Premier. Thank you for your, your foresight to recognize the importance of public consultation on these critical legislation. To Mrs. Mackenzie Agard, thank you very much for the presentation, entertaining questions. Our Register of the High Court, Mrs. Vanderpool Nibs, thank you also for elaborating on points where necessary and for ensuring that we answer the questions correctly. Mrs. Annette William Sylvester, thank you also for providing insight and your experience working with the bill and especially the areas which would be more beneficial to us as we progress, such as being able to have better identity of persons, years of service, sorry, years of residency or years of time within the territory. Thank you also to Ms. Hill for the questions, for, answer, for presenting the questions to us and for facilitating. Behind the scenes, we have our GIS team. We are always mindful and we recognize the importance that you bring to the table to make sure the public is well informed. Thank you very much um, for your leadership, Ms. Smith. And to the listening public, thank you for being a part of this process, for appreciating democracy and the need to ensure that we exercise democracy, especially in critical pieces of legislation. I want to thank you very much for being online and I wish you a great evening, the balance of your evening, and ask also that you continue to pay attention, as the Premier mentioned, to other pieces of legislation which will come on board but will require your overall input. Thank you very much and have a wonderful evening. Thank you.